Hey everyone, I'm Dr. John Barbieri, a board certified dermatologist and acne expert. While adult acne can feel frustrating and isolating, it's important to know that you are not alone. In this video, we're going to talk about everything you need to know when it comes to adult acne. Why it happens, what it looks like, who gets it, and how to treat it. When it comes to adult acne, it often looks a little bit different from adolescent acne. It tends to be more inflammatory, so more of these deeper, bigger, more painful kind of bumps and pus spots. It also tends to have fewer of what we call comedones, those whiteheads and blackheads. And some people, including adult women, it can be a bit more along the jawline, and we see that in about 10% of people with adult acne. However, most people with adult acne, the distribution, where the spots are, is actually pretty similar to adolescent acne. The difference is it tends to be more inflammatory, a bit more difficult to treat, and again, it has less of those whiteheads and blackheads, those comedones. When it comes to who gets adult acne, it's most common in women. About 50% of women will have acne in their 20s, about 30 to 40% in their 30s, and about 10 to 20% in their 40s. However, men also often get adult acne. About 30% of men will have acne in their 20s, and about 10 to 20% of men will even have acne into their 30s and 40s. In addition, about a quarter of people who have adult acne won't have had acne as a teenager. And this can be especially frustrating where someone doesn't have much acne during adolescence, but now it comes on in adulthood. So what causes adult acne? Well, it's many of the same things that we see with adolescent acne. It's fundamentally about the sebaceous gland, the oil gland in our skin. Hormones and genetics can lead to this sebaceous gland being activated. When it produces too much oil, that can clog up our pores. And it's also food for acne bacteria, see acne as it starts to overgrow. In addition, when the oil gland is activated, the cells start to proliferate, they start to grow. And these cells can clog up pores. This is called hyperkeratinization. And then our immune system also plays a role. Some people have immune responses that help to control that overgrowth of cutie bacterium acnes. Other people have immune responses that really just add fuel to the fire and bring more inflammation into the picture. So fundamentally, the number one factor about who gets adult acne is really genetics. It's not someone's fault. This is not something where typically it's something they're doing wrong, like diet or washing their face or changing their sheets. This is usually just about genetics. However, hormones can sometimes play a role, especially in adult women with acne. Some people who develop adult acne will have a hormone problem like polycystic ovarian syndrome. And especially when we see other factors that suggest high androgens, that suggest hormonal issues, like developing hair on the chin or chest, we call it hirsutism, like developing insulin resistance or acanthosis nigricans, this darkness that you can see around the neck or in the armpits, or irregular periods, those can all be signs of hyperandrogenism. And when we see other features like that, in addition to acne, we wanna be on the lookout for things like polycystic ovarian syndrome. But most people who have adult acne won't have any other medical issues. This is just genetics. It's just something that's, in a way, bad luck. It's not their fault. It's not something they did. It's not something they're eating. So how can we treat adult acne? One of the first things is just being kind to yourself. Having adult acne can be feel really frustrating, and it can get compounded by the fact that we're often getting a lot of unsolicited advice from other people. We can be feeling stigma about it where people are acting like we're younger, or immature, or we're not taking good care of ourselves. So it's really important to be kind to yourself. Adult acne is usually not your fault unless you're doing something like anabolic steroids. This is mostly something related to genetics and hormones and factors that we just can't control. So how can we try and treat adult acne? Well, in women with adult acne, antiandrogens, hormonal therapy can work extremely well. Hormones are a fundamental cause of acne in everybody. Whether you're a 14-year-old boy or a 35-year-old woman with acne, hormones are really important. They turn on that oil gland. And especially in people who are genetically prone to acne, this can be super relevant. So for adult women with acne, things like combined oral contraceptives, birth control pills can be a great treatment because they can help to suppress the production of androgen. They can reduce the production of androgens. They also increase something called sex hormone binding lobulin, which helps to keep those androgens from going in to the oil gland and turning it on. They tend to be a pretty safe treatment. Lots of people are on this. And I try to tell people, think about like an acne treatment. Don't think about necessarily like birth control. That's like a potentially useful other effect of it, but just view it as like an acne treatment pill that has extremely low side effects. 
Most people can tolerate it really well. I have some other videos to talk about how to think about combined oral contraceptives and acne, so check those out. The other hormonal therapy that can work really well is spironolactone. Spironolactone is an old blood pressure medicine. It's not something that was originally developed for acne, but it has these anti-androgen properties. It blocks the effects of hormones at the oil gland and can be extremely effective for adult women with acne. We have a whole other set of videos that go into this in detail, but it's again a treatment that's very well tolerated. In the SAFA trial of adult women with acne that was conducted in the UK, about 95% of people had really no meaningful side effects from spironolactone. The most common ones tend to be blood pressure effects, which makes sense based on what it can do, and that's having low blood pressure symptoms, like headaches, dizziness, lightheadedness, sometimes feeling tired. So spironolactone, again, most people, 100 milligrams a day, which is my preferred starting dose, won't have any significant side effects. If that dose is causing some side effects, going down to somewhere between 25 and 75 milligrams per day can often help to reduce them. And those doses still can work very well for many people. And then there are some who end up needing higher doses will sometimes go as high as 200 milligrams a day, depending on how people are responding to it and whether or not they're having side effects. Now, spironolactone and birth control pills combined oral contraceptives make an awesome team because they really complement each other. Spironolactone blocks the action of androgens, birth control pills, combined oral contraceptives block the production of androgens and help to increase sex hormone binding globulin. Spironolactone can actually make people maybe a little bit more likely to bleed or not have blood clots, whereas combined oral contraceptives slightly increase people's risk of blood clots. So those side effects nicely again complement each other. Spironolactone lowers people's blood pressure and combined oral contraceptives can raise it. So they have really nice complementary side effect profiles. And then the last thing about spironolactone is it can cause irregular periods and spotting and combined oral contraceptives can help to regulate the cycle. So these are a great team to really help address that fundamental role of hormones in acne. So combined oral contraceptives and spironolactone. We also now have a topical antiandrogen that we can use in men and women with acne, and that's class codorone. So this can be a great option for people who have adult acne, where again, hormones can often be a really important role and are trying to avoid systemic pill medicines or have had side effects from them. Clascoderone also complements the other topical treatments that we're gonna talk about. So it can be a great part of an overall comprehensive strategy. Now, moving on to other pill medicines for adult acne, and often we do need pill medicines because this acne can be more severe and more inflammatory. We have oral antibiotics, and these have both anti-inflammatory properties. We talked about how inflammation is foundational to the causes of acne, and they also have antibacterial properties. They help to reduce that cutie bacterium acne's overgrowth that we were discussing. When it comes to picking an oral antibiotic for acne, I have, again, a whole set of videos on those. I typically will use either doxycycline or sericycline, and that's because I get worried about some of the potential side effects of minocycline. There certainly is a role for it. It's less photosensitizing, but I think as a first line oral antibiotic, it's not the one I would typically do because of that potential risk for severe side effects like severe drug reactions like dress and nerve vestibular side effects like vertigo. So I usually use either doxycycline or sericycline depending on patient preferences. Doxycycline is usually a bit more accessible. Sericycline has a bit less side effects, less photosensitivity, potentially less impact on our gut microbiome being a narrow spectrum antibiotic. In general, oral antibiotics, the main side effects are gonna be gut related. So they're gonna be nausea, diarrhea, yeast infections uh, in women. So those are gonna be the typical ones to think about. Doxycycline also can cause sun sensitivity. So that's an important part of counseling when we're using that. Isotrinone also can be an option for adults with acne, especially because we talked about how persistent adult acne is. You know, many people have this going into their 20s, 30s, even 40s. Having a treatment that can really deliver, deliver a durable remission of acne can be really valuable to those with adult acne. And isotrinone is one of the only treatments we can have that can do this. Now, it's not the right treatment for everybody. It does have some important side effects, and we go into how to try to manage and prevent those in other videos. But for those with especially more severe adult acne and are looking for long-term clearance, long-term remission, it can be a really valuable tool. And while I do think that long-term rates of clearance are a bit lower in those with adult onset acne or adult persistent acne, it still often can deliver long-term clearance in probably about 60 to 80% of people who are treated with an adequate course of it. The other treatment to think about that's along the lines of isotrinone is 17, 26 nanometer laser. These devices use a specific wavelength of light that's preferentially absorbed by the oil glands in the skin. 
And similar to isotrinoin, these can target the oil glands in the skin and shrink them and lead to long-term improvements in acne. However, unlike isotrinoin, because it only goes where we're aiming it, where we're using it, we can avoid a lot of those side effects we worry about with isotrinoin, like eye dryness and other skin dryness, like effects on the inside of our body, like our gut health or other issues that we sometimes, mood changes that we think about with isotrinoin. So it can be a very helpful treatment. It's not quite as effective as isotrinoin, but many people on the phase three trials of it, about 50% of people after six months later from the last treatment had clear, almost clear skin. So this can be a very effective treatment for adults with acne, and it can deliver long-term improvements too. So that's another special and nice feature about it. Moving on to topical treatments, for those with more mild to moderate adult acne, these can be very valuable. And here it's very much similar to what we might do for adolescent acne, with the caveat being that since adult acne tends to be more inflammatory, treatments like topical retinoids, which really help a lot with comedones and less so for inflammation, aren't usually used as much. I don't think they're as helpful. So I typically will start with things like benzoyl peroxide and topical antibiotics and things like plascoterone. And then we'll also think about topical retinoids as well, but they're usually a bit further down on my list because they can be irritating, especially for people with more sensitive skin. And as we do get older in life, our skin barrier gets a bit weaker. It gets a little bit more sensitive to irritation. So I'll typically start with things like a benzoyl peroxide wash and a topical antibiotic like clindamycin. And if that's not sufficient, we'll add things like topical retinoids or things like clascoderone. And if we wanted to do them all together, we have a now a fixed dose combination product that combines adap combines adapalene, clindamycin, and benzoyl peroxide together. And that with clascoderone, now you have two products. You're hitting basically all of the main mechanisms of action that we have when it comes to topical therapies for acne. They're very convenient. And we know convenience is important. It helps improve adherence and outcomes. So that can be a really nice option as well, doing something like this fixed dose combination of clindamycin, adapalene, benzoyl peroxide together with clascoderone. Now, when it comes to adult acne, people are often looking for some kind of a root cause and they're thinking about lifestyle interventions as well. And also adults tend to be more receptive to these things because they have more control over stuff like their diet. Adolescents sometimes are eating what their family's eating, what's in the house. They don't get to necessarily go shopping and pick their foods. Most adults do. So dietary and lifestyle interventions can be very helpful here as well. And I have a number of videos that go into how to use diet and nutrition and nutraceuticals to treat acne, but I want to briefly dive on it here. The most important thing is thinking about low glycemic index diet. This can be good for overall health, and this can also improve acne. There are several randomized controlled trials that support that eating a lower glycemic index diet, that's less sugar and highly processed foods with refined carbohydrates, doing that can improve acne. It also tends to result in weight loss for those who are looking for it and tends to improve blood sugar control for those who have issues with that. So low glycemic index diet is a great place to start for those who are looking for a dietary intervention to address acne. And it's pretty good for our overall health as well for most people. Beyond uh, low glycemic index diet, dairy sometimes is helpful for some people reducing that. Whey in dairy and other potential hormones and factors that are in there can stimulate IGF-1 and that can lead to more activity of the oil gland. And there is some observational data, some studies looking at what do people with acne tend to eat or not eat that suggests that dairy may have a role when it comes to acne. That being said, a lot of people like to eat dairy foods. Dairy can be a nice source of protein and calcium and vitamin D. So we have to be thoughtful about that. If we're going to eliminate dairy, we need to make sure we're not losing out on those important macro and micronutrients. And if you're not noticing a lot of improvement from stopping dairy, it's, a, I think, relatively lower usefulness dietary intervention. And I wouldn't really push that to an extreme. I think it's something that can often make people a bit miserable trying to eliminate things from their diet, and it's sometimes not that helpful. But for those who are looking for dietary strategies, that's another one to consider. If you're eating a lot of chocolate, chocolate is another one that can influence acne. There are a few nicely designed randomized studies that support that chocolate consumption, even irrespective of the glycemic load, the sugar in it, can lead to increased acne. And so for those who are consuming a lot of chocolate and maybe don't care that much about eating it, that's another thing to consider trying is reducing chocolate consumption that may lead to improvements in acne. But again, if you enjoy chocolate, the likelihood it's gonna have a super meaningful impact is pretty low and I wouldn't drive yourself crazy on these things. Beyond those dietary interventions, there's not a lot of evidence for other things. If someone notices that making some change is helpful, awesome, that's great. But I wouldn't start doing all kinds of elimination things, like trying to cut out gluten, trying to cut out all these different foods, 
often doesn't help that much and usually just makes people kind of sad because they can't eat things that they enjoy. And we don't need people to feel more sad acne. Don't acne is annoying enough on its own. Let's not compound it by doing sort of dietary things that may not help. Moving into nutraceuticals and supplements, there are a bunch of things that can be helpful here. One of the first ones is zinc. Zinc can have some anti-inflammatory effects. It also can have some effects on the sebaceous gland in the skin. This can be used topically. There are some topical treatments that have zinc and things like niacinamide in them that can be useful. Oral zinc can also be helpful. The main challenge with zinc is that it typically requires pretty high doses, like in the range of 30 to 100 milligrams of elemental zinc per day. And a lot of people may have some stomach upset when taking doses that high, which can limit it. It's also important when taking high doses of zinc to think about copper supplementation because zinc and copper complete for absorption. So if you're taking a lot of zinc, that can potentially lead to worse absorption of copper and potential copper deficiency issues. So usually people will recommend something like five or 10 to one of zinc to copper. So if someone's taking 30 milligrams of elemental zinc to think about taking like three milligrams of copper either with it or at some other point in the day to try and avoid having issues with copper deficiency. When it comes to picking a formulation of zinc, the ones that tend to be most absorbed are things like zinc picolinate and zinc lysinate or ones like that. So usually that would be what I'd recommend. Uh, in general, I would just suggest people try to get to a dose that they can tolerate that's in that 30 to 100 milligrams range if they can, and that can be helpful for acne. Another helpful supplement for acne is vitamin D. There are studies that show that people with acne tend to have lower vitamin D at those that do not, and that people who have lower vitamin D tend to have more severe acne. There are also randomized controlled trials that among those with low vitamin D supplementing that, and this is not any mega dose, it's just taking 1,000 international units a day, a standard supplement, that can improve acne, especially inflammatory lesions. And we're talking about in adult acne how inflammatory lesions tend to be the main one that we see. So that effect in inflammatory lesions can be very helpful. So vitamin D is another supplement to consider for adult acne. And then omega-3s are something to consider. There's some emerging evidence, both from some small pilot trials, some randomized studies, and also from Mendelian randomization studies, that omega-3 has a role in acne and supplementing it may help with acne. So omega-3 supplementation, whether it's through diet, eating more like fatty fish and foods like that, or through taking a dedicated omega-3 supplement, can be another helpful thing to consider when it comes to treating adult acne. So to summarize, adult acne is relatively common. About 50% of women and 30% of men will have acne that starts or persists into their 20s and beyond. So those with adult acne, you are not alone. It's often something related to genetics. Unless someone's taking anabolic steroids or has really extreme dietary tendencies or really bad hygiene, it's usually not related to those things. For most people, it's about genetics and then occasionally hormonal conditions like polycystic ovarian syndrome. So those who have other factors that might suggest something like that, like dark hairs on the chin or chest, hirsutism, acanthosis, niagara cans, darkness in the armpits or neck, or irregular periods, that's where you want to consider some additional evaluation to look for that. But for most people, it's really just genetics. There's not that much that you can do to change this. That being said, there are a bunch of topical and systemic treatments, as well as procedures that can be very helpful for treating adult acne. Using things like antiandrogen therapy, like spironolactone and combined oral contraceptives, and also topical antiandrogens, which we can also use in men with adult acne, like clascoterone, can be great places to start. Oral antibiotics can also be helpful, just as they are in adolescent acne. And then other topical treatments, especially things like benzoyl peroxide and topical antibiotics and topical retinoids can be very useful for those with adult acne. We have procedures like 1726 nanometer laser that can address that oil gland, the sebaceous gland that's fundamental to acne and can help us potentially avoid some of the side effects that we see with isotretinoin. And for those who are looking for more long-term clearance of acne or those with more severe acne, isotretinoin can be a great option and works well in adult acne too. Finally, there are a number of dietary and nutritional strategies that we can use to address acne. And these include things like lower glycemic index diet, zinc, vitamin D, and omega-3s. Well, I hope you found this video helpful. If you have, please give it a like and subscribe to the channel. Your support really means a lot to me. Ask me your questions about adult acne in the comments below. And until next time, see ya.